I do these live streams every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, and the goal is to help the average individual understand that you can reach financial freedom in 10 years or less, make work completely optional, even if you're not starting from the best position. And there are, lucky for me, several people who come back every week with some great questions and continue to learn. People who are taking steps to reach financial freedom, closing on deals, finding their agent, learning their market, figuring out that their strategy might not work in their market. And every now and then on social media, I run into somebody who doesn't know me, hasn't seen my Bigger Pockets episode, hasn't seen my YouTube channel, and they ask a question in a forum. I give as detailed an answer as I can, often more detailed than was asked for, because if you say something in a financial group that isn't all-inclusive of the idea, you get pounced on by people who either disagree or don't understand that you actually know the answer. So I ran into somebody recently, not going to share their name because they just found me, and they didn't say, hey, please share my name in your video. They asked some questions, and we had some back and forths, and I was trying to help, and they said, those are great questions. Here are some more, and they were very nice. They said, hey, if you're like willing to, if you'll take the time, can you answer these? And I said, hey, not only will I do that, I'm going to do it in a video. So you can get all of the nuance to the answers that would be hard to put into you know, text answer or instant messenger answer, because something small like somebody saying, what's better, FHA or conventional? And if you just say some really simple facts, conventional is easier to get accepted by the sellers. Mortgage insurance lasts the entire length of the loan with FHA. And you don't go into the rest of the details of what FHA is actually used for, when conventional makes sense, the, the changes to conventional real recently. If you don't answer in a forum completely, people will jump on you. So I kind of wanted to answer these questions in video format so I can give more detail. The first one is, and this I think is a great question to start with, anytime you're trying to get information from somebody, your first couple of questions should be something like this. Instead of a test your knowledge question, it's a question of how many rentals do you have? So if you're looking to learn a new strategy, if you want to do wholesaling or flipping, or the Burr strategy, or if you want to do buy and hold rentals or get better with buy and hold rentals, this question vets the information. If I said my response was, well, I've always wanted to own a rental and someday I might. Like over 90% of the realtors you work with who never own one rental property, you would know that's probably not the best source of information. So to answer that question, and I'm transparent here on my channel, if this person is joining me, not sure if they will, but it's a great question to start with. How many properties do you have? I have currently 18 rental units. I retired in 2022 with 16 rental units that produced a little over $204,000 in profit after expenses, after taxes, after setting aside for future repairs, maintenance and vacancy. They are on eight properties. So I don't buy single family houses. I buy small multifamily. I own one single family that I purchased before I was an investor. The rest have been duplexes, triplex, or a fourplex. And if that person is watching my video for the first time, I will take a second to introduce Millennial Mike is my co-host for today, who invests out of state. Um, what is your current rental unit count, Mike? <clears throat> I have 15 rental units and 10 total properties. Okay. And you've been investing since 2018? Correct. So in the current market climate, you've been able to do that. So this is why I think it's a great question for somebody to start with. And what does your portfolio look like? Because then the information might be relevant to you. If you're somebody who thinks, if I don't have 100 units, I can't possibly learn from this person. Well, then we have Matt, the Lumberjack Landlord, and Michael Zuber from One Rental at a Time, who both have over 100 units each. That's kind of our group of people here that make content together. The next question and I completely understand this question from a new investor and sometimes somebody who's been investing for a while. Do you ever feel like you are vulnerable to the market? When you talk to somebody who doesn't invest or own rentals, they'll say things like, I'm really glad I don't own rentals because property values came down in 2010 and 2011. So anybody who owned rentals from 2008 and 9 must have lost out and that's not actually what happened. 
If you are a wholesaler or a flipper and you're counting on property values to remain the same or go up and property values come down, yeah, you can be vulnerable to the market. If you're a buy and hold investor, I don't see us as being vulnerable to the housing price market. Prices can drop and it doesn't impact us. This is with residential loans, fixed rate debt. Uh, if you have an adjustable rate loan or a commercial loan with five units or more where you're going to have a loan reevaluation period, property values dropping can be a serious problem. But Mike and I both really like fixed rate debt. We do 30 year, I would do 40 year or thousand year if it was an option. So vulnerability to the market in my mind would be to rents. Can rents go down? And in some local markets, they can. So if you invested around Detroit, when the car manufacturers moved away, your rents tanked. If you invested around Silicon Valley, when the dot-com crash happened, your rents tanked. Market-wide, market-wide, entire country, rents have never once gone down since we started tracking the data in 1940. But I plan on them going down. I invest like they're going to. I don't invest like some syndications did in the last few years where they were planning and counting on rents to go up significantly for their deals to make sense. So first, I don't want to own a 10 unit apartment complex because that's in one area that pulls all of your tenants from one area. So even if you have something like a base or a port or colleges around you, the base can close down. There could be a, a BRAC meeting and it's gone. The port can go on strike. Anything can happen in one local area. So I specifically target rentals, duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes that are at least 10 miles away from my other properties so that they're each close to several economic drivers, a base, a port, college, hospital. Mike, you invest in Gary, Indiana, which is close to Chicago. Mm -hmm. So you have a massive city not too far away. It's 45 minutes away. And the majority of your tenants in, I think, almost all of your tenants in Gary, Indiana are through Section 8. So we can actually track fair market rents and see what's happening January 1st, 2024. In my area, Section 8 rents are going up significantly. In your area, they're at least going up some. They're not going down. So to also diversify so that we can be ready for rents to go down, we don't over lever. I don't want to be 100% levered on a property or in my portfolio. When I was growing my portfolio in my growth phase, I wanted to benefit from appreciation on more than I invested. So I wanted about a 70% loan to value ratio. And then when I retired in 2022, I wanted it around 50% loan to value. I'm around 40, so I'm probably going to add some debt to my portfolio. Uh, Mike, how do you handle being prepared for rents to drop? We've had this conversation before and we've actually both done videos on this topic about what rents do during a recession. Um, and the fact of the matter is like Dion said, even in the worst recession, the very worst recession we've ever had, the Great Recession, rents dropped 2 to 3% for about two years, and then they recovered. And so planning for any type of substantial drop in rents almost seems like a fool's errand. However, in the interest of being conservative and safe and for giving peace of mind to people out there who are potentially interested in planning for all contingencies – my recommendation would be, and this is something that I've talked about before, the fact that if you run the numbers on a rental property, a very, very rough, quick calculator of what could help you figure out if it's going to be a good rental property is if the principal interest, taxes, and insurance are less than 50% of the rent. So if a rent's for a thousand bucks a month, your principal interest, taxes, and insurance are 500 or less. That's a really good rough indicator. What that also does for you, I mean, from there, you have to obviously build in property manager and things like that. But what that does for you is that if there was a drop in rent, it would have to be so substantial, so monstrous in terms of how far rents would have to fall just for you to break even. Forget losing money. There would have to be a black swan, never before seen, heard of event that occurred in our economy to drop rents by 50% just to break even. And if that right there isn't taking enough conservative steps, then then I then maybe real estate investing just isn't for you. The last way that I diversify to protect myself from rents going down, let's say something like the base did close or the port went on strike or a major company like Boeing or Amazon moved away, is I diversify my tenant type. I keep about one third military, one third section eight, and one third working and retired so that 
even a pandemic, stock market crash, prolonged government shutdown, or something like that doesn't impact my entire portfolio. The last question that this person sent me in this group of questions, how do you find your tenants? I've been lucky with my one property, but I'm nervous about people destroying my property. First, congratulations on that one property. That's more than I want to say 99% of people ever do. It's over 90% of real estate agents never own one, one rental. So you're already ahead of the game for most people. How do we find our tenants? To me, it's as important to find your tenants as it is to screen them. It's, it's very easy to find tenants. <laughs> that a lot of them you're not going to want. There's a, I want to make a video soon on um, avoiding a certain scam. And it's not a scam. It's, it's something that people do that they don't realize how damaging it is. If you're on social media and you see somebody or if somebody knows you own rentals and they reach out to you and they say, I have a friend who's looking for a rental in your area. Do you have anything available? Never have anything available for somebody who reaches out to you. There are rentals available on Zillow, Apartments, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, Trulia, Realtor, Redfin, like every platform out there. What they're saying is, I have somebody who landlords will not rent to. Are you stupid? That's the complete question. Because they're looking to get a cheaper rent because you don't know what you have. They're looking to get onto your emotional side so that you'll overlook something like an eviction, bad credit score, or bad tenant history. So that video is coming in the future. But how do we find our tenants? And it, I like how you followed it up with, I've been lucky with my one tenant, but I have concerns of people destroying my property. There is a shifting type of fear as we invest. When you, when you bought that first property, when most investors get the first one, we have this fear changing moment. The first concern when we're learning our market is we start making offers. The fear is what if they don't take my offer? What if I get outbid? What if somebody else's offer was faster or had a bigger earnest money or was more attractive to the seller for some reason and I don't get the deal? So that's a, a fear in the beginning. That quickly shifts to, what if they take my offer? Now, I have to pay for an appraisal, pay for an inspection, figure out how to be a landlord, find a lease, right? So your fear is going to shift like that in this scenario. The fear starts with, what if somebody trashes my property? And then when we realize that you can mitigate that fear by doing a few things, first, plan on it. Plan on them trashing your property. Figure that every tenant is going to do at least $10,000 worth of damage. They're going to punch holes in the walls, pour cement down the drain. They're going to break all of your appliances. You're going to spend $10,000 when they move out. The financial freedom that can come from owning rentals is worth the risk of losing $10,000. We start with having a reserve of at least $10,000. Having good deposits, strong screening criteria. A lot of people screen based on income, and I don't care about income. I primarily care about credit score and eviction history. Now, this can be area dependent. So in Gary, Indiana, if somebody has a, a 650 or higher credit score, they, they own a house. Right. But what is the credit score that they've worked for to protect? Is it 580? Is it 620? In my area, 650 is completely, re completely reasonable in Washington State for tenants. I go with 700. Even Section 8, military, working or retired doesn't matter because I have enough demand for my properties that I can filter through to the ones that meet that criteria. And yes, I have Section 8 tenants with an 831 credit score because Section 8 is fixed income, not low income. So the less demand you have for your properties, the lower some of your criteria might go based on the area that you invest. But tenant screening is very important. You want to do eviction check. You want to do credit check. You, If your area allows criminal background check, that's becoming less and less of a possibility. Um, but how do we find our tenants? It's not through the friend and family network. I made that mistake when I first started. Uh, Christine asked me this uh, in the comments recently of these things that you teach. Did you know all of this when you started? <laughs> no. I didn't know any of this. Is, what I'm trying to teach is what I've learned in a decade of investing. When I started, Christine, um, I thought, who can trust a stranger? I can't do that. I'm going to rent to a friend. Who would need a lease with a friend? Because they're a friend. So handshake, rent to friend, single parent. So when rent was late, I figured, well, I can identify them as single parent. Their single parent life's challenging sometimes. So late rent became never rent. Um, in my first year, I made a lot of those mistakes. So I would, from day one, do what you did, is reach out to somebody 
who's done what you're trying to do and ask these questions. How do you find your tenants? I, for a long time, used um, cozy.co, which was purchased by apartments.com. And then last year I started using Hemling. In the beginning, when you have one rental or you're starting to add some, I would go to apartments.com or Zillow and list on both of those because they have a couple of platforms that each one puts out. See which one gets you the most interest and then filter through because it's free for you. The owner of the rental doesn't pay anything. The people who apply pay an application fee that doesn't go to you. So you're not making money off of this. Apartments.com or Zillow is the one making that fee to run the credit. So you'll get a credit report, credit history, eviction history, and figure out the criteria that works for you. And then make sure you follow through on your screening process. I don't recommend this for most people. Uh, Mike and I both work in law enforcement. Um, I, I got... Um, pushed out in 2008 because of the recession, but Mike still works in law enforcement. I like to go to applicants' houses to sign leases. I want to see how they live where they're at now. I trust my situational awareness. They don't even go to the restroom unarmed. So I'm going to go and I'm going to be safe at somebody's place. Don't do that for the average person, but meet someplace public where you can see their car. How do they park? What does their vehicle look like? Is their car full of trash? Is it dented and scratched up? Because how you do anything is how you do everything. You're judging the tenants based on communication style. How fast or how long does it take them to respond? Can you understand what they're trying to communicate? Do they seem demanding right off the bat? Because what, how you do anything is how you do everything. And you filter through your tenants that way. So the last thing I'll wrap up with how I find my tenants is I do like to maintain that ratio of one third military, one third section eight, one third working and retired. It would probably be, I haven't even looked to see if it would be. It just feels like it would be. So I assume it is. It would probably be illegal to run an ad that says section eight only, military only, or no military and no section eight allowed, right? So I wouldn't do that, but I can control how I advertise. If I have a unit opening up and to to close as I can to maintain that one-third ratio of military working Section 8, and I want to fill it with a military tenant, if I advertise on base, our friends Josh and Mary just reached out and said, how do you advertise on JBLM? So I sent in my contact. Here's who you list with. You still list it on apartments. Anyone can find it. But if you list on the base, who are you most likely to get? If I want a Section 8 tenant and I take my listing that is going to be public and I send it to the counselor the week before and I say, this goes live Tuesday, if you know of anybody looking for a three or a four bedroom unit or whatever is being rented, can you let them know? Because then they're probably going to be one of the first people to apply. Finding tenants in the last, I want to say, five years has become exponentially easier than it was uh, 20 or 30 years ago. It used to be friends and family cork board at the gas station, um, or worse, property manager, right? That often makes more money than you do. And if you invest locally, I usually recommend and teach several ways for people to self-manage. If you invest like Mike at a distance, yes, property manager makes sense. And while Mike, you, you found your tenants for next door and the duplex that you're house hacking here in the high cost of living area, property manager does it as, at a distance. Now you've gone to short-term rental. So you're literally they're coming to you now and you're filtering through. So I hope that those questions, those answers showed you that we're here to show people how to get started in real estate. And most new investors have a lot of the same concerns. I think that's why this also made a great video is while those were questions from a specific individual, those are all questions we've all thought. We've all wondered, well, how do you find tenants? I didn't know how to find tenants my first year. Um, actually, I didn't know how my second year either. And that fear of people destroying your property. My brother retired with 10 paid off rentals, and it was actually something he said that got me over the fear of a tenant trashing your property. He just said, I expect every single one to. So I have reserves. I screen tenants. I have a list of contractors and handymen. That's what I do. He does the work himself that I'm going to call when certain work needs to be done. It's already planned like it's going to. So every time I've had a tenant turnover, and now I've had five tenant turnover. So that's not my specialty is finding new tenants. Um, I've never struggled with it. And none of them have trashed the pot. My last three got their full deposits back. So 
send me more questions if you made it to the video. What we're going to do now for the rest of this uh, live stream up until 6 p.m. Pacific, because this is the last December course meeting. So I hope to see anybody who's in the course in the Zoom call at 6 o'clock. Let me go up here and get to the howdies. I see Bill was first. Sorry, Dave. Good times ahead. Howdy, Frank. CD Cashflow. Angel R, would you guys accept Christmas cookies from tenants? I'll let you answer first because I don't want to give my jaded opinion until I, want to, I see what you have to say. Would you take cookies from tenants? 100%. I would take the cookies. I would thank them very kindly. I would say I really appreciate the gesture. And then I would not eat those cookies. Uh, now, if it was the house hack, tenant that I first had, the mom with the two kids who I had a very good relationship with and like chatted with her all the time. Maybe, maybe I would actually eat the cookie, but you, you never want You never, ever, ever want to be rude to somebody when they try to give you something. There, there, there's a lot of cultures out there that they pride themselves in doing those types of things and in, in, in giving food and giving gifts. So you need to be cognizant of being respectful to people. So if you don't feel comfortable eating it, then I don't blame you, but uh, but at least be respectful. Yeah, um, I wanted to wait until you answered because I, I think I'm personally jaded on this. So I was an officer for eight years and there are a few things that I've only done a few times. You're on the SWAT team, so you get shot at almost every week. In eight years, I had three officer involved shootings. Um, but I had, and I'm gonna pluralize this, dozens of poisoning incidents. Co-workers, family members, whatever you want to respond. It's just, I don't know why. It's it's a thing. So working at the CDL school for the last decade before I retired, there was a lot of times where people would bring in thank you gifts. Exactly like you said. Thank you very much. It's very appreciated. I don't eat proffered food. So, but I'm jaded from what I've seen in the past. And I've seen some horrendous. <laughs> Um, Anna Kay, howdy. Brian Keith, howdy, everybody. Janitor on fire has a question. I'll let you answer it. Because that's nipples. the way God designed us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Janet, howdy. howdy. Howdy from Los Angeles. Besides MLS, what do you recommend to if I'm going to market research on properties? So you market research on properties, I and I see that you said besides MLS, because that's primarily the one I use to find my deals. All of my deals are from the MLS, conventional lending. Like I've not done driving for dollars. I've not done mailers. I've not had, I've had the idea, but I've not gone and sat in the divorce section of the courthouse and tried to get contact info of people who need to sell their properties. I haven't done any of that. Market research, I would think to study single family houses, you can use Realtor, Redfin, Zillow to get an idea of what rents are, to get an idea of what home prices are. When it comes to small multifamily, most of them are not on Realtor, Redfin, or Zillow, and they they won't be. Most home buyers, not most, many home buyers will sell without a Realtor, and they'll go to Redfin or Zillow and list their property. That doesn't happen in the small multifamily um, realm. Most people who own small multifamily are investors, and, and investors understand that the realtor earns every penny because you're going to get a better price on your deal. So most of them are only on the MLS. So I've had a lot of people say, there's no multifamily available in my area. And I ask, how do you find it? And then they're just not there because my deals, my properties that I've purchased were not on Redfin, Zillow, or Realtor until two or three months after we closed, they showed up as pending. <laughs> so Mike... You are the more network type person. Actually, I have a video coming out Thursday on why I don't want a team. I had, I had to ask during my members only class. I, or I was like, uh, I want to make this video. I'm not sure if it makes me sound like a real douchebag or not. But And they all said, no, we're, we're happy when you sound like a douche. You should do that video. So I'm going to make that video Thursday. Thanks for everybody's recommendation on that. Other ways to find your deals other than the MLS. I need to react to that video when you post it and debunk it. It'll be Dion Talk exposed. Get my next big clickbait title going. Um, how else do you find it? Well, so when I look at the MLS, I, I use realtor.com. That's my favorite one. I like it better than Zillow. I like it better than Redfin. I use realtor.com. If you want to find off-market deals or you want to look for more deals, you need to go on Facebook Marketplace. Um, you need to go on Craigslist. 
and you need to go um, in Facebook groups. So for instance, for me, there's a Indiana real estate investor Facebook group, and there's one other one, Indianapolis, maybe it's Indianapolis real estate investor Facebook group. Those two gro groups constantly get deals posted from all across the state. Um, typically they're from wholesalers or for sale by owners. Craigslist, same thing. For sale by owners will go to Craigslist, Facebook marketplace, same thing. They'll go to Facebook marketplace and Craigslist because they're trying to advertise it somewhere. A lot of times it's wholesalers, occasionally it's the for sale by owner, but that's where you can find off market deals. Beyond there, beyond those easy from your phone, from the computer, then it goes up a level. That's when you actually need to start talking to more and more people. First of all, anybody you talk to, even if you're looking for properties and let's say that you live in, I'll use cities people know, let's say that you live in Seattle, Washington, and you're looking for properties in Seattle, Washington, but you see wholesalers posting about Tacoma or Everett or Bellevue or other cities doesn't matter. Still network with them. Still contact them. I'm not interested in this one, but I see you're a wholesaler. Do you also have any properties in Seattle? Because now they may either trend, they may have people in their network. They may be considering whether or not they should start papering markets in, in different markets and branching out. So talk to everybody who's on the wholesale chain and get those people on your team. The last deal that I got, the duplex that I got in Indiana came from a wholesaler that I met in Matt, the Lumberjack Landlord's boot camp. met him there. He owns like 70 properties in Rochester, New York, and wholesales exclusively in Rochester, New York. Decided he liked me so much, he just goes, I'm going to find you a deal in Indiana. I'm going to start trying to wholesale out there. Doesn't live in Indiana, lives in New York. Decided for whatever reason he liked me enough that he just wanted to do it. Calls me in a month, gives me to date the single best deal that I've ever done hands down purchased it for 20 grand it's worth 160 right now and it's been two months um and now he's talking to me about another one which we should talk about later which is a great video i'm going to make called how i'm going to pay three times the value of this house and still make money on it anyways that's topic for later today um it really it comes down to networking so dion's wrong he needs to have a team he needs to be like one of the Power Rangers, one of the Avengers, one of the kids summoning Captain Planet, whatever other team references you guys want to go with. He needs to figure out how to help or work with more people. He needs more friends. <laughs> friends are just people who need stuff. <clears throat> so not only am I giving you permission, I'm asking you to do a reacting to exposed and, and disagree with me on that video because I will actually prove that I'm able to retire because I don't have a team. That's that's fine. Jonathan, Buzz Tim, Josh, howdy. Uh, financial firefighter, hola, Mark. Aloha, Mark. There you go. From Mike says you're up from your nap. Dividend Dave, howdy, 20th. Sierra and buddies, howdy. Michelle, howdy. Eugene, happy Wednesday. I wanted to make sure YouTube wasn't playing games with me as I missed many of your videos. The only question is, would you recommend long distance investing in different continents? I wish the YouTube um, notification system functioned. Like it works, it just doesn't work as intended. But if you're going to invest on different continents, because here's the superpower of living in the United States that I don't think most people understand. If they watch some of our content, you've probably heard us say it a few times. But in the U.S., we have 30-year fixed rate debt. And it seems to be shifting to 40-year pretty soon. And I would do 1,000-year if they would let me. So 30-year fixed rate debt is a superpower. If, if you have five-year adjustable interest rate in Canada and the U.K. and most places outside of the U.S., debt is what causes the biggest problems. So if you're on another continent, which I've talked to you before, you are, and you're looking at investing in the United States... I would watch Millennial Mike to know how to invest at a distance, use a lot of his team building. This is where it is different than my investing strategy and it is important. But I'd also look up a YouTube channel named A Canadian Investing in the United States. So it's not quite continent to continent, but it is a foreigner's, you know, outside of the country person's perspective of what it's like to invest here. And then I would add the caveat to I'm a buy and hold investor. My goal is that all of my properties perform better than all of my marriages. I want them to actually be until death do us part. That might be the case for a foreign investor because of the FERPTA tax. So if you're investing from outside of the United States and you own a rental, 
you get depreciation, you get write-offs, you get rent, you get appreciation on multiples of what you invest, you get fixed rate, you get all of these benefits, right? But if you go to sell, you pay 15% of the sales purchase price in tax. This is key. Normally, taxes are paid on the gains. If you made $100,000, you think, oh, I'm going to pay $15,000 in tax if you're going to pay 15%. No, if you sell a million-dollar property and you make $100,000, you're going to pay $150,000 in taxes because it's 15% of the gross value of the sale. Doesn't make owning properties unattractive. It makes selling properties less attractive. Dan Dave, everybody hit that like button because when you do, an angel gets its wings. Antoine, howdy. Everyone, long time listener, but first time actually making a live chat. Thanks, Dion, for everything. Thank you. Very glad you're here. Hopefully, the information is helping. T. Peel, howdy. Howdy. Fitness and finances, howdy. Jared, good to see you here. And Laura, howdy. Uh, yes, dividend day of Jared was talking about being a money lender, came into the um, private money lender, was in the members only group the other day. So if somebody's looking for private money, Jared's the person to reach out to. T. Adams, we got RV hookups and casitas as short term rentals. All full right now, looking for more. Awesome. Nice. Great strategy. I've, I still have friends. Living in an RV, renting out their house to Airbnb, uh, that's that's a good strategy. It's an interesting house hack that isn't often talked about. I have another friend who owns a house, put an RV pad in, rents RV pad, and when then he wants to travel to take the RV, those tenants move into his house, and they get the lower section of the house for the same price that they pay when they're in the RV. Works out for both. Uh, Basilio, howdy. 14 viewers haven't hit the like button. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Jared, um, uh, you can post it if it'll let you. Sometimes it won't let you do a link, so put a space between maybe and it'll go in there. If you aren't selling and you cash flow is long-term rental, it doesn't bother me that the market comes down. I bought my house in Arizona in August knowing full well the equity would drop. Yeah, it doesn't bother me at all. It would actually be kind of cool to go back and have an argument with the county tax assessor and say, <laughs> look at this new value. My taxes should be less. Uh, Jared, with a super chat, thank you. Much appreciated. <clears throat> yeah, private money shout out. There you go. Wealth building journey. Howdy. We had an interesting off-air, on-air conversation the other day. Hope you're doing okay. All Nighter Hider, howdy everyone. Got my hands full again for a while, hit that like. Uh, if Wayne Wong, if Mike grows out his beard, mustache, and, and shaves his head, he could be a younger Dion. <laughs> if Dion was three feet taller, um, <laughs> I've turned the six pack into the keg. Like there's some <laughs> other glaring differences between us. Uh, I've said it many times, we're both, uh, you know, divorced single fathers who managed to get custody of their kids. You are a police officer. I'm a police officer. I'm just the younger version of you with more hair and less rentals. I should show you pictures when I was exactly your age. My hair touched my belt. Yeah. I need to see some of these because if I see them, they're going to make it online. <laughs> I've put them online before. They're I have to, to find them to send them to you. I'm just going to scroll far enough back on social media until I see them. Sierra, howdy. To T. Adams, uh, live and flip mostly during DIY, value add rehab. Um, have one single family home rental, also started renting out our land to RV travelers. Awesome. Tiffany, will Dion be doing Q&A? That is, um, so the thing that's challenging about these live streams is I do an intro. Usually I try to keep it to around 10 minutes, but it probably went 20. Giving people time to put questions in the chat. And then to be fair, I go through and answer questions with as much detail as I can. And yes, I answer the silly ones from people sometimes, but I answer the ones that people are trying to learn from. And sometimes it makes this lag between when you posted, we'll be Dion be doing the Q&A and here we are. But you probably asked that 20 minutes ago. 
So sorry it took us that long to get there, but we're trying to be as thorough on each question as we can. And when you ask a question and we're that thorough, you'll be glad we did. Uh, all Nighter Hyder, you're great too. And Jared, so Laura, thanks for the reminder on the like. We're just at 19, let's go to 20. Every time you do a like or Jared, like you did the super chat, every time somebody does that, it tells the YouTube algorithm that somebody might like the content and shares it with more people. So that's appreciated. Jared, I like this little community. I made the first member Zoom meeting Saturday and I love the small group format. I picked up a few new nuggets of info. Yeah, I, I do too. That's what I like about the, the members only and the course thing is it's usually like tonight, probably in the course, six to 10 people join the Zoom. Sometimes it's more, um, but you get a lot of, a lot of information from people doing some cool stuff. Ninja Vanish, howdy, good to see you. Jared, in Washington County where I live, but I do not invest, uh, went up $450 a month. So glad I buy in Arizona instead of Oregon. Yeah, and, there, and there were, I don't know that I've heard of anywhere where Section 8's rents went down for 2024, but I've heard somewhere it didn't go up as much as it did here. I'm basically getting a $1,000 a month raise in January and almost a $500 a month raise in March. So, Dion, go ahead. You're the employee of the month at your company. I'm the employee of the month, right? Exactly. You deserve that raise. Oh, who was I was talking to somebody yesterday and they were so excited that they had this week off. And I was like, me too. <laughs> <laughs> might have been me, actually. It might have been. Yeah, I think it was. It <laughs> we're, we're connecting on the 28th, right? Yes. Okay. T. Adams, sub two, Gator Lending, good to know. This is going big. Nice. Good to hear, Jared. I diversified a little bit with tenants in a way. I'm doing rent by room. If I lose one tenant, I still have seven more rooms in the eight bedroom house. Nice. That's one argument I hear often when someone is talking to me about how they would rather have a 20 unit apartment complex than a house. And they'll say, if I have 20 units and I have a tenant out, well, I have 19 paying. Well, of course. If you have the money funds to buy 20 units, I didn't buy a house. I probably have 12. And if I have one of them vacant, I have 11 paying. So it's a good point. Um, and the rent by the room thing, I really like that. Oh, Jared, hey, if you're new to the community and you do rent by the room, if you're looking for somebody that specifically covers that content, he's not very active on YouTube anymore. His channel got shadow banned because he said something a leaning a little to the right. And so they canceled his channel. Um, Oh, why did my brain shut off? I got here in Seattle. Todd Baldwin. Todd Baldwin. Thank you. Love my memory. In case I have not mentioned that to anybody. Todd Baldwin. He's on Instagram. You can find him. He's been on Bigger Pockets. He's been a millennial millionaire right up several times. He has a killer strategy on Rent by the Room and some really cool things to do to help limit tenant turnover, to, to uh, manage those relationships of renting uh, room to room. Dividend Dave. Mike, are you investing in any other parts of Indiana besides... The Northwest. No, and people have asked me this before. I've seen some good deals that by the numbers work really well. But the same thing that I talk to everybody about when I talk about investing at a distance and how you can become very quickly wowed by the spreadsheet math, it doesn't mean anything until you have the team in place to actually make those numbers materialize. Because if you don't have the right property manager, it'll all fall apart. If you don't get the right tenant, it'll all fall apart. If you don't have the right handyman and repairman in place, one repair, it'll all fall apart. There's so many people you need in place before you actually do a deal somewhere that even though I might see a deal that I wish I could do, I wish it was a little bit closer to my area because the numbers look great. The amount of time it would take for me to build out this new team, it's not impossible. It's not that I couldn't do it. It's just why devote that time to do it in a new market and have to go through the learning curve when I could just say no to this deal and then look and find another deal that's as good or better in my existing market. And you do own one unit in Chicago. Right? That's yep. kind of close to Indiana, but it's not out too far from there. Right. All Night at Hyder thinks Jared's a great addition. I think so too, but I think a lot, everybody that joins. I don't know that we've had, we haven't had, which is really weird. We haven't had to block the people who are the Crash Bro true supporters. That the, that the sky is falling, end of the world. Somebody asked in a video with uh, one rental at a time, so I want to answer it really quick here. Um, we were talking about um, unemployment doubling in 2024. Matt thinks it's, it's going to go up. I think it's going to go up a little, but not much. And, and Zuber thinks it's going to go up a little bit more. But uh, the person asked, 
can you cover what the crash bros have called for the last decade, right? So I don't know if this is somebody who supports the crash bros and says, well, it's different this time, but it's it's every couple of weeks, there's a new reason to make a new video on why you shouldn't take action and buy real estate. And so I'll, I'll caveat this with, anybody telling you to wait to buy real estate should be blocked. And anybody telling you to hurry and buy real estate should be blocked, right? The market doesn't tell you when to buy, only two things do. And it's not rates, it's not prices, it's not rents, it's not predictions. So just to, to quickly go through the decade, 2013, home prices in some areas started going above where they were in 2008, which made it unsustainable. We heard that over and over and over. 2015, we had the silver tsunami. Baby boomers were gonna start retiring. This is actually popping its head up again now. But baby boomers were gonna start retiring and it was gonna flood the market. 2018. Interest rates went above 6% and nobody can buy a house when it's over 6%. So everybody's going to have to sell them and it's going to flood the market. 2020, we had a pandemic, eviction moratorium. 2021, we had forbearance ending. 2022, we had interest rates double. 2023, we had high prices and high rates. There has never been a time in my entire existence where everyone was saying, this is the best time to buy real estate. People look back and say that was a good year or that was a good two years ago or whatever. But it's never going to be, no one's ever going to say it's the right time to buy. The two things tell you when to buy, it's not the market. It's not predictions. Well, let me ask you a question, because at the time I was in middle school and high school, but the, the message that seems to be perpetuated by Hollywood and the media surrounding the lead up to the 2007-2008 recession if you watch a movie like The Big Short, the message that comes out is that was actually the only time that everybody was running around with chickens, like chickens with their heads cut off, saying, you got to buy right now, buy, 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 buy. And the one time when everyone agreed you should buy was the lead up to the biggest crash we've ever seen in housing. So it just adds to the fact that you need to be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy because all the rest of this time when everyone's been saying all the things you just said double dip crash coming shadow inventory interest or blah blah should have bought could have gotten a 50 percent appreciation on your equity over just a two-year period in some cases and the one time that i know even though i can't remember it for myself because i was 15 at the time but the one time I think I know when everybody was saying bye, bye, bye was the one time you should have been like, hell no. <laughs> so that's a very close um, iteration of what happened. Right. And when you see it in the movies, they, they, they kind of go, what, what tells the best, most entertaining right. story? Here, here's what actually happened outside of the movies. It wasn't the best time to buy real estate. Nobody was saying it was the best time to buy real estate. It was the easiest time to buy real estate. We had all the first-time buyer programs that would lend out 105% of the loan so you could wrap your closing costs into it. We had ninja loans. You didn't have to prove your income or your assets. You can go in and say, I make $400,000 a year. Let me sign the paper and buy whatever you wanted. And since prices were going up, here's the part where you were, that yours ties in. Everyone was saying, it's a great time to buy because interest uh, prices are going up. So you can buy with an adjustable rate mortgage. And in two years, you'll be able to refinance to a fixed rate loan. So the ease of buying, not the, um, no one was saying everybody should be buying. There was plenty of people that called the crash. They became famous. Now, some of them threatened to sue when you point out things like that person called 19 of the last two recessions threatens <laughs> to sue. <laughs> so uh, making that video again, but I'm going to, I'm going to target crash bros, not a specific crash bro. <sighs> Yeah, he wouldn't have sued. But you should have just left it up. He lost so much money because he had to close down his bank right now. All he's got is money to throw at lawyers for suing people. So, Jared, I'm a relatively new investor. I started as a private money lender in April and I bought my first investment property in August. Congratulations. That's really cool. I tried to get another one before the end of the year for tax reasons, but didn't make it. You will get the tax benefits next year. And anytime you miss a deal, remember, Jared, you didn't miss your shot. You missed that shot. William Mike, this is from Wealth Building Journey. What does your out-of-state network look like? How many different people do you meet before you found the people? Did you meet before you found the people whom you could trust? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've I've talked with so many people 
And one of the things I always tell people is the most important person is the one who's not trying to sell you anything is the one who doesn't have a dog in the fight for their own financial gain. It's the other investors. The reason Dividend Dave, can, who's now owns rental properties in Gary, Indiana, the reason he can come and ask me questions and know that he's getting the best advice possible is because I don't get paid at all in any way for referring anybody. When, when Dave comes to me and says, Mike, who's your ins home inspector? Who's your real estate agent? Who's your property manager? Who's your handyman? Who does your painting? Who does your flooring? I just sent him a screenshot of a phone number for the guy I've already used. And the only, the only kickback my way is that if I get it wrong, it makes me look bad. So 100% of my focus is on doing a good job for Dave. And so that's why it's so important to network with other people so that you have that guy in your, in your network that you can go to, who's going to give you those referrals. So how do you, how many people do I have to talk to? I, I talked to other investors who then pointed me in the right direction. And because I got pointed in the right direction, I didn't actually have to talk to that many other people. So I only talked to three property managers. I only talked to one turnkey provider and one home inspector for my very first rental. Now, over the years of buying properties out there, and when I moved away from buying turnkey to buying value add, well, value add comes with so many more problems in terms of who's going to fix all of these problems that I had to build out the network very quickly. But again, I immediately went back to my local, to, to the other investors. My handyman, Tony, does a huge amount of work for me, organizes a huge amount of work for me, checks on properties for me, checks on the work other contractors did for me. That came from Dominic, who invests in Chicago. But again, like Dion said earlier, Chicago and Gary only 45 minutes away. Tony's been working for Dominic for 20 years. Guess where Tony lives? Gary. <laughs> now he works for me more than Dominic. I pay better and he doesn't have to commute as far and, you know, steal people away, steal good people away nicely. Of course. Sorry, Dominic, if you're watching this, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, depending on what particular team member you're looking for, like when it comes to real estate agents, I've talked to so many, I mean, 50 at least uh, when it comes to handyman, they can talk a good game, but until they actually do the job and then if they do the job and they do the job, right. Well, you don't really need to keep networking with new handyman. Like dude, you got a good thing going work them until they can't work no more and then find somebody else. Actually, I just got a text from one of my handymen that's going somewhere tomorrow for me. And I, and I had that stupid new investor thought. I could probably just go do this. I'm I don't have nothing going on tomorrow. Nothing. I'm going to play some World of Warcraft and let a handyman go make some money. That's what I'm going to do tomorrow. So, uh, Actually, I'm playing Elder Scrolls Online if anybody plays nowadays. <laughs> T. Adams, <laughs> uh, to me, fear is they take your offer. This is real. You have to figure out all the costs associated with the offer and the learning curve of what happens after you close. Wealth building journey to T. Adams, the concerns or worries change throughout the acquisition process. Come join the members only group. We have videos in there that walk through the offer acceptance, due diligence, and closing. All Nighter Hunter, Mike's network reach is unlimited and he only attracts honest people of good character. So that's the thing now we do. Is, with ladies. <laughs> how's that working out for you? <laughs> hey, you said honest with good character, message. Mike. Come on. <laughs> I've only met one person that you've dated that had was honest and had good character. Who's that? Because if anyone, yeah, okay. Um, we don't got to dime people out. That's not going to end well for me. <laughs> Marina, she's awesome. Oh, she's a lovely person. Like, yeah. So, and, but that doesn't mean that anybody else I didn't like. But um, <laughs> uh, Jared, if you are a Bigger Pockets Pro member, Rent Ready is available to you. There you go. T. Adams, yes. How do they keep their car? How is it really? This is actually something I picked up. So, I ran a nonprofit. We worked with a little over 1,200 employers, and some of the employers would share some of the things they did to vet the people that they were going to hire. And one of them was, they would have people walk out and look in your car during the interview and take notes. Is the windshield cracked? Are there dents? Where did you park? Did you back in? Did you pull in? Do you have car seats? Like all of the things you can't ask during an interview. Because we had employers, and I'll admit to this myself, who preferred to hire single parents. It's a form of discrimination, but single parents are the source of income. They're less likely to quit jobs. They're more likely to be a stable employee. And this is just the opinion of several of the employers that we worked with. How you do anything 
is how you do everything. So T. Adams, yeah. Now, do they keep their car? Tiffany, sorry, it took so long to get to your question, but yes, we're doing Q&A. I'm house hacking. Are there any good listing sites to find housemates? I already use Roomies and Roomster. Those would probably be, Roomster would have been the one that I would have suggested. Um, Mike, rent by the room. Any other resources for that? I, I think that's a Facebook and one. Craigslist. You can post, you can post ads on Facebook and Craigslist for roommates. And it's just, it's just another networking opportunity. Like it's going to cost you 10 bucks to put the ad, 10 bucks, to put the ad on Craigslist, just put it out there. Cause there are segments of people who that's the only thing they look at for whatever reason. And Tiffany, I would make sure that you know, your local laws, laws change based on the type of property and what you're using it for. A couple quick examples in California. If you own a duplex, it is not rent controlled. You put it into an LLC, it is now rent controlled. In Oregon, if you purchase a small multifamily, like a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, and you own or occupy one of the units, that property is not rent controlled. So can you discriminate based on sex? No. But if it's a roommate situation where you live, you can be selective of the genders that live with you in some areas. Can you discriminate against pets if it's an emotional support animal? If you have allergies and you also occupy the property, in some areas you can. So nothing is a blanket rule everywhere. Know your local laws to know how you can run your systems, especially if you're renting by the room, where you live. Chris, hi, Dion. Hope you're getting well. Was I not? Well... I don't remember you being sick recently. <laughs> I think hope you're getting well. Maybe he's from the future. Maybe he meant to People say. People watch this in future well. land. That's a future person telling me I'm going to get sick in a few weeks. Awesome. Uh, T. Adams, dirty people keep a really dirty car. They do. Wealth building journey. Advertise at the MWR, Mineral Welfare and Recreation Facility. Kind of. So... Every military installation base will have an MWR, Morale, Welfare, Recreation. Not on every base do they handle housing, but they will know the agency that does. So my recommendation is contact MWR, whether it is a reserve unit, a, a training base, anything, and say, for this installation, who handles housing? All night I had to just to understand that tiny house can be cleaned in minutes, and then re-dirtied even faster. Yes, but your trim can't be put back on really quick, and the holes punched through the doors can't be covered really fast, and uh, the pet damage that could have happened. So true, cleanliness isn't even actually what I'm looking for when I'm at their house, because I do know, especially I've, I have this really cool tenant, and I, I think I'm her social time. About every six months, I go by for six checks for the next six months. And the house is immaculate when I'm there. And I, I think I think it's like she knows, okay, this date, this time, this is when somebody's going to be here. And a whole bunch of stuff happens before that. So you're right. Cleanliness can be faked. But the repairs in the house, how they keep it, a little bit harder. T. Adams, I interview people and hire them based on how their car looks and is on the inside. I don't advertise. I do that. Most people didn't. I shared what the, the employers did for the nonprofit actually taught a few classes. There's a video on my channel from several years ago that is still used at the CDL school on how to prep a resume, how to prepare for an interview and the interview mistakes most people make. Um, and it's usually because people don't understand that when you're being hired, it's not about what's fair. It's an employer has a microscopic point in time to make a macroscopic decision that's going to impact their company, that position, their co-workers. And so every bit of data that they can use to get an assessment of you is going to be used. Jared, Dion, this is a great idea. I am 15 minutes from Luke Air Force Base in Glendale, Arizona. I have access to the base as a disabled vet. I'm going to post some ads if they let me in the VX. You can, but if you reach out to the base, start with MWR, they'll know who to direct you to. There's literally a website that is given out at Family Orientation. Um, in JBLM here, it's usually about 300 people a month that get the, the the thing saying, hey, here's the rent. It's the stack's got every all the resources, military discounts in the area. And 
uh, military friendly landlords. If you're asking to advertise on base, that means you are okay with that person probably having somewhere between a two to four year duty station and then being moved when they get orders. Uh, and some landlords don't take military because they don't want that guaranteed tenant turnover at a certain point. And my last um, military tenant that just moved was in the place nine years. So it's not like it always happens really quick. Yep. Yep, TMs have someone go out and look at their car. We did too. Yep, absolutely. And for us, it was where did they park? Here's here's a quick tidbit if you're if you're going to go for an interview. Don't park in the visitor center. That makes you a visitor. You're not identifying with the company. Figure out where the employees park. And if you've ever worked in the grocery industry, you know that there's a building that's a store, and then the close parking spots are supposed to be easy for customers to find a place so they can walk in and spend money, and employees park at the edge of the parking lot. If you are going for an interview, park at the edge of the parking lot like you are an employee who respects the business's need to make money from customers who are coming there when it's convenient to spend money. REI Stoners. Howdy, Josh. Yeah, sent the ad to the base and the housing authority. Awesome. That's right, you're getting uh, Section 8 approved, too. That's really cool. Uh, Laura to Tiffany, do you live close to hospitals or universities? If you do, contact HR for student housing. Great suggestion. Did you skip Love. a question, Dion, from I, Oculus? Oculus. Oh, I did. Thank you. That's why you're here. If the yield looks good, would you invest in a mobile home? Tips from David, you're, you've heard. I'll start with you. I know where that. I know what the ending of that meant. Would I you invest maybe, in a mobile home? I don't, I don't know exactly who he's referring to there, right. David. Uh, mobile home. Um, so if the mobile home is going to go down in value long term, which from what I understand, I've never owned a mobile home and I have not really researched them that much. But the consensus that I've read online and when I've talked about mobile homes is mobile home parks are great. But owning a mobile home itself, because it has a tendency to go down in value over time instead of appreciate in value like other pieces of real estate, even if it cash flows, it's not great because it's going down to zero. So I'm not the expert in this. I don't own any. I'm never looking to buy any. I don't want to buy any, but I'm not against the idea of a mobile home park. Um, polar opposite. I would absolutely buy mobile homes if I found one for sale that that um, my offer would get accepted on. My brother specifically targeted mobile homes because they're almost all exactly the same. You learn how to fix the HVAC system, how the electric works, how the plumbing is set up. Everything is easily accessible and identical. Even if the layout is different, a 30-year-old mobile home and a two-year-old mobile home, the same repair guy can fix everything. There was a period of time where I would, I would have agreed with Mike um, because I didn't understand how it worked and mobile homes would lose value over time. At about 2012, when the housing crisis hit and affordable housing and prices started to go back up, lenders shifted. There was a period of time you couldn't do fixed rate 30 year debt on a mobile home. They wouldn't do it. Now you can. So I see mobile homes next to stick belts where the stick belt sells for $340,000 and the mobile home sold for 315. And the mobile home was from the seventies. Right. So they're holding their value. They're selling. It's, it's when is the lending available? And again, it's buy until death to us part. So I'm not looking for when I want to sell. Does it make sense? Can you get lending on it? Absolutely. The main reason my portfolio doesn't have mobile homes and my brother's does, I think he's 10 rentals, seven are stick built, the rest are mobile homes, is I don't have the skills that he did. And he went in and did repairs and maintenance on them. Um, so I found mostly from the MLS, but I would absolutely buy a mobile home if it had the right yield. I could get lending on it. Uh, understand that your rent's going to be a little bit less for a mobile home than a stick built in the area. So that does affect your numbers. Call your section eight and say, is there a variance between stick built versus mobile home? If you're allowing rents, I'm in two counties. One of them has a, like a 90%. They'll pay 90% of the value for, for mobile home. And the other county, the one that I actually do work in and like, will pay 100%. Whatever they'll pay for a stick built is what they'll pay for a mobile home. The amount of value that uh, a mobile home has can be offset by the cost of completely replacing it in 20 or 30 years if it needed to be. If I was looking at a mobile home to purchase on the land, I would make sure how many times has it been moved because some insurance companies won't insure a mobile home if it's been moved more than twice. So verify that in the purchase and get an insurance quote beforehand before, you know, during your 
due diligence period or before making your offer um, to make sure that, uh, that there's nothing there that's going to blow up your deal. Thank you for pointing that out. Tiffany, got that. Ninja Vanish, like button. Awesome. Thank you for linking the course, Wealth Building Journey. There's still a discount going on right now of $100 off. Um, howdy, Richard. Good to see you. All, uh, all Nighter Hider. I've looked into mobile homes. They seem to be strictly cash flow play with the cost of the space and not owning the land. That's for mobile home parts. My brother buys like two acres with a mobile home on it and then rents it out. That's, he doesn't do mobile home parks. Um, time is it? Five. Okay. Dividend Dave. You all know cookies from me be poisoned. <laughs> That's how I express my love. Yep. That might have been the defense of many women out there who tried to murder their husbands. No, I swear, Your Honor, I was showing him how much I love him. I wanted to take care of him when he was sick. It's, my, it's one of my favorite jokes from when I was a kid is the girl says, if you were my husband, I would poison you. And the guy says, if you were my wife, I would drink it. <laughs> Jason, Merry Christmas. Day late. There you go. Jared, I use Zillow, Redfin, Reventure app, and City Data. There you go. Basilio, looking forward to meeting you guys in Vegas right around the corner. Time flies. Yes, February 17th and 18th is the one rental at a time event in Vegas. In-person tickets are sold out. Um, Jared was talking about possibly coming down to spend some time with people during our Monday through Friday because the event sold out. But we're going to have some midnight Denny's meetings for people who want to hang out in Vegas. We'll see you there. We also have, uh, since Jared's in Oregon, might come up to the uh, Robin Hood event on January 20th, where Mike and I are presenting. I think Lumberjack is presenting. I'm not sure if it's in person or on Zoom, but you'll also meet Cody and Christian there from Cody and Christian Multifamily Strategy. All night, Ryder. Good to see you in Vegas time. We'll be here before we know it. Laura, I love city data. It's a great source of information, including the crime area. Nice. <laughs> Justice League reference would have worked there, Mike. Oh, yeah. I absolutely. Well, I threw out the Avengers at one point. So, but yeah, I could have thrown in Justice League as well. True. All Nighter Header says Dion's not wrong, just partially right. <laughs> exactly. There is no one right way to do this, but there is a one right way for you. Rob, weirdly not asking you if you've been shot at this week. Short-term rental Rob. update. Um, yeah, so the, December was my first month where I broke $3,000. Uh, I made 3400 bucks in rental income, rental plus cleaning fee income for my Airbnb. So my first month was $2,850. Second month was $2,950. Third month was $3,400. My goal is to hit $3,500 consistently. Now, my concern is, obviously, December is a very high travel month, and January, February is supposed to not be great months. So I am anticipating low-income months in January, February, but you know, I'm hoping I still hit at least maybe 2,500, but we'll see. I already have about 1,500 booked for January, so that's a good sign. Um, and I've got lots of people booking in the summer. In fact, I need to raise the prices for the summer because I'm getting people June, July, August, summer vacations just getting booked in advance, big time. Um, and so that's good news. Um, ha I had to do my very first claim for damage. Somebody over there destroyed the dining room table. Uh, they like put a hot pot on it and scorched the table. And it's one of those classic. So I have a nineties themed Airbnb for those of you who don't know. And if you remember back in the nineties, there were those Oak tables that everybody had and you could extend the tables and put leaves in it and pull the leaves out to make it long. I have one of those in there because it just fits perfect with the times. Well, they destroyed it and they didn't even destroy the leaf that I could have pulled out. They destroyed the corner of the table, which can't come out. So anyways, you look up how much it is to buy those things. They're like 1500 bucks for a cheap one. So I, I put a request in through Airbnb. So I'm going to learn how that process looks. Um, but so far, yeah, I mean, I haven't had any huge major problems. I've had some people lie about whether or not their pets were house trained. And I had to go through the cleaning process of cleaning that and random cleaning drama, but nothing super bad yet. Um, we're just working the process. I'm going to give it at least to the summer. And if I'm not consistently making 3,500 bucks a month, that's my minimum I need to make. If I'm not making 3,500 a month, I'll turn it back into a short-term rental. 
Because at 28, 29, 3,000, when I could make 25 as a long-term rental and never have to clean, never have to do any of the other work, it's not worth it unless I'm bringing in at least 3,500. Couple quick questions that popped up that are relating to this topic. Um, do you use any dynamic software to adjust the prices for holidays? Yeah, and everybody has recommended Price Labs and I, I'm gonna enact it. I haven't done it yet, but yes, Price Labs is the one that I'm planning on using. I've had it recommended multiple times. And does the damage claim have the possibility of hurting future rentals? Do they get yes. to go back and adjust their... So, their yeah, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, the person who... <laughs> The way it is with Airbnb, when somebody damages your property, the way the app has it set up is first, before you can like file a claim, you have to first request the money from the tenant, the person who stayed. So I, and it asks you to like upload pictures of the damage, which I did, write a summary about what happened, which I did, include receipts or screenshots of what replace value would be. So I just Googled 90s themed oak leaf table and screenshotted the top 10 uh, tables that were there. And the cheapest one was a thousand. They went all the way up to like 3,500. Then you request how much you want to replace it. And then you submit that request to the other individual. And then they have 24 hours to respond. If they don't respond within 24 hours, which they didn't, you then can send it to the insurance company who's supposed to contact you within a few days, which is the process I'm at right now waiting to hear from them. Because this happened a couple of days ago. Julie just left a comment saying that she's in Marysville and she has one of those tables. She's not using it. It's in storage if you want it. Julia, 100% take it. But I'm still going to get paid from these people oh, yeah. for damaging mine. But yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'd love to. I, I love. I'm so, I was so sad. I was like everything they killed, they could have broken the lava lamp. Get another one for thirty bucks. Destroyed some VHS. You can find tons of those still. But those tables are gorgeous and hard to find. Howdy, CJ. All nine hundred says taxes are paid on gains that have settled. The legal accounting tricks used legal accounting tricks to keep them from settling. True. I just, I'm not sure how it would happen with the FERPTA tax because it's not on gains. It's on the sale price. Rob, well, I'm headed to Brazil, so you all get a break. Nice. Um, Michael Jewell on Facebook lived in Brazil for a long time. I was actually going to connect with him when I was going to go there with my brother and ask for places to go. So keep notes. Let me know. Tiffany Millennium Mike. How did you find your house hack tenants? I'm having a hard time finding some, maybe because it's the start of the year. And to be clear for Tiffany, you live in a duplex. You live in one side with your son. You were house hacking the other side, and you've now converted it to short-term rental. Uh, so it's not by the room. But this yeah. time of year, I just placed a tenant in November. Um, I had 27 people show up at the open house. Tiffany, I put my email in the chat. If you can send me your advertisement, you know how you're listing your rental, I'll take a look and I'll and I'll let you know if there may be something that you can do to tweak it to draw up attention. But Mike, how did you find your tenants? Yeah, I also list my properties for rent on Zillow. And I think the last two tenants that I got were from Zillow. I mean, I got tons of interest from Facebook, but it was it was the same problem with all Facebook Marketplace, which is everybody asking, is this still available? Oh yeah, I want to come see it, and then not showing up. Craigslist, we had a couple of people come look and it ended up being Zillow in both cases where somebody ended up showing up and we were like, we're going to go with them. They offered to pay the entire year's worth of rent in cash up front day one. And then when I renewed the lease a year later, they paid that entire year's rent up front with cash day one. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. And then Jared, I, again, thank you for the- Wait, 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 Dion, 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 Dion. Hold on, hold on. Sorry, 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 sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. I, uh -huh. In the house hacking video that I made about Dave Ramsey, I talked about how much money I had made in five years of house hacking in terms of rent coming to me in those five years. So when I first got this thing, it was rented for $1,600 a month. Then it went to $1,950 for two years. Then it went to $2,150 for two years. And now I've done Airbnb for like three months. In five years, I've made $127,000 in rental income in a five-year period. So my question for you, Dion, I know you probably can't do the math right now, but you should. You should do the math on what your entire history of house hacking is from day one to now. Because for everybody who ever detracts and says, oh, you don't want to live next to tenants or, or you know, it's risky, whatever it is. Okay, but at the end of the day, if I cut you a check for $127,000, would you maybe change your mind? The answer for most people, I think, would be, yeah, all right, maybe I'll take that money. So I'd be curious to know, because I know Dion's been house hacking for much longer than me. He also house hacked a couple of fourplexes along the way. So obviously those brought in more rent than just one single unit for my duplex. 
So where I got, and I'm just talking for you to do your math, Dion, where, where I got uh, $127,000 in a five-year period, Dion with 10, 11, 12 years, I, I mean, it's got to be 300, 400K, like significantly more money than than people would give house hacking credit for. And honestly, the equivalent of like an 18 an hour job full time for 12 years or something would be my guess. So when you ran the math on that, was it just how much rental income came in or did you run something on how much you didn't spend since you were living for free? No, I just just did pure rental income, not equity appreciation, nothing. Just how much rent did I actually make in five years? So... Okay, I'll do that math. It looks soft without really looking into the math. It looks like 127,000. That's what I made. But I'm thinking the fourplex would have been a different number than that. Yeah, oh yeah, you should have made more. But I've only that. got that in 2020, so that's fairly recently. Because remember, there was six years of house hacking before the fourplex that was just me and the duplex. Right. So. But that's still oh, six I, years. Yeah, I totally did that wrong if we're doing income. Yeah, that would have been way off. Yeah. So. Not what your actual profit was of like a couple hundred. Like what was the rent? Like they pay their monthly rent. Yeah. For how many years you were doing. So it looks like 178,000 is on the soft map. I'll okay. actually do a whiteboard video on what does house hacking do for me? You know, that, that scam that Dave Ramsey warned everybody about. <laughs> uh. 178,000 is what I come up with rental income off, off the house hacking. Sweet. Um, Jonathan, any advice for when rent money is stronger than old investors realize? Strategy for leading the fair value. Single family and bedrooms are strong. Advice for when rent money is stronger than old investors realize. Strategy for leading the fair value. So yeah, one thing I, I do run into often is my friends who've owned rentals for a long time, my brother included, I have a friend who has 30 rentals and he has tenants from 2003 that he's never raised the rent on. They're paying 2003 rents in 2023. So 20 years. Um, every time I interact with now he's retired with 30 rentals and he's doing fine. Right. But he does all his work himself. He's out climbing on roofs himself. He, I don't know that he has the money to maintain the properties the way they need to. I should, I've, I've never asked to like look at his books. I'm not that kind of person, but if he had raised the rents, these tenants could have new flooring, new windows, upgraded heating systems all over the years um, without it negatively impacting my friend's ability to retire with his rentals. So, yeah. The thing I really like, if there's anybody that's new to my channel that hasn't heard of the binder strategy, my tenants ask me to raise the rent. I just met with three tenants last week and they asked me to raise the rent. All three of them, 100%. Uh, not 100% of rent increase, but 100% of them asked for a rent increase. Which means in the next few years, I'm, I've am talked to a roofer now, I'm getting quotes of doing um, eight properties. Two of them have new roofs. The other six, I'm spacing out over the next 10 years of doing the roofs. I'm going to schedule them now uh, well in advance, the tenants are paying for that over time because my rents have stayed competitive. So you're talking about old investors that don't realize the strength of rents. It's, a lot of them can't believe what the rents could be because what the tenant was paying for the rent last year doesn't set the rent. Your expenses do not set the rent. Area average rents set your rents. And there's a lot of landlords that have owned a rental for a long time that have never even done a price comparison because they're thinking of what the increase is to their tenant instead of how much are they losing by not being closer to area average rents. Oculus, tenant asked me about a dog. Told her I needed a pet deposit. I think she may have snuck a dog in without paying the deposit. She was good and pays on time. How would you handle it? With an official letter saying, um, well, no, not an official letter, because you don't know for sure if the pet's there or not. Have you asked? Do you have an animal there? Because if you did, there's this is the pet fee. Schedule an inspection. Know your local laws in Washington State. You just have to give 48 hours of notice. If she's good and she pays on time, 
is it worth, is it a hill worth dying on, right? Is it worth irritating a tenant, making them leave? I would handle it officially saying that you need to add it to the lease. You need to know the pet because the pet type, because your insurance is going to care. Um, and I guess it depends on what your communication style is like with that tenant in the past. How would you handle that, Mike? One of your tenants possibly sneaks in a pet. Yeah, this is the reason why I always say pets are welcome and I just try to do the pet fee and stuff because they're going to, they're just going to sneak it in there anyways. Um, or they'll go online and print out their emotional support animal thing that's totally valid and legit. Yeah, whatever. Um, they're going to bring it in. So if you can get the pet right, great. But if they are a good tenant, they communicate well, they take care of the property and they pay on time. That's all you want. And when it comes time to do the move out inspection, if extra damage has been done by the pet, well, then you charge it out of the deposit. If you can prove definitively that they had a pet in there at some point, yeah, sure, you can go through the hassle of demanding that pet rent, but you may turn a good tenant into an abrasive, upset tenant. And I'd rather just keep the good tenant happy and fix whatever damage there is down the line. One of the things I do to help limit tenant turnover is allow pets. I look for properties that are pet friendly whenever possible. I like separately fenced yards. And again, don't have to deal with the fake ESA printed out thing. And if they get in with a pet without it, without me knowing, I don't really care. Uh, their deposit's going to go for any damage, just like a pet deposit would or a pet fee would. Uh, Santi, thank you for the compliment. It is much appreciated. All Nighter Hider, uh, Ninja gifted me an addiction to the membership. Yeah, Ninja won, no one knew it was a contest, but Ninja gave away a bunch of uh, memberships. And so he won a free one hour private call. T Adams, Wealth Building Journey, thank you for the invite. I have been holding back on that due to not being able to share much. Larson, how does, howdy. I'm noticing that when I run the numbers on properties here in New Jersey during this climate, it is much harder to gain cash flow. Is it me or is that just the climate we're in? That is very much the market that we're in. You will never find cash flow deals on the MLS that have a really good return that are better than everything else in the market because of the competition. You're not the only one looking. It's always going to seem like you just can't find deals. So from 2013 to 2020, what really worked was speed. I wanted to get my offer in before the seller was inundated with offers of people waiving contingencies and um, offering to name their kids after the seller, trying to, to get you know their attention. So if I can get my offer in quick and get it accepted, then the seller would have sunk cost theory and feel like they've already connected with me. So even if they got a better offer, they're less likely to, I've never had one drop mine and go for the better offer. But I knew I didn't have as much negotiating power because they had backup offers that were better than mine. In the last three years, what shifted, Larson, and this is in every market, speed is not your friend. Change the way you're looking. This is what I did. I, instead of looking at, I wanted at several agents with auto searches set up to, see, to have my quickest access to the listing on the MLS. And within an hour of it being posted, I wanted to have my offer, letter of pre-qualification, all submitted, DocuSign, not a feel you out email of, well, you think you'd be open to an offer? No, I wanted the offer actually submitted. Now what I did is I shifted it. So I wanted to find properties that were on the MLS that were listed for at least three times longer than what was normal. So in the counties where I invest, the average days on market is somewhere between six and nine. Right? So some of the counties are six, some are nine. So I was watching things on the market that were there for more than 30 days. The last two that I made offers on that I have offers accepted on were on the MLS for over a hundred days. Find something, me and Mike had to drive out here and go, is this even a duplex? Couldn't tell from the stupid listing because it didn't show separate meters, didn't show points of uh, entrance. Find the bad listings that have been listed a long time and then make ridiculous offers. I made an 80% offer. This was listed for five, I offered four. We went back and forth several times. They went 477, I went four. They went 444, I went four. They went 422 and I went four. And then I quit. I backed out and I said, actually, I, I rescind my offer because I had another one accepted. And they reached out and they said, we'll take four. And so here I am. So that's what shifted. And, and yes, I actually also expanded my market by about 30 minutes to find some new ones because there's been a shift with remote work being more of an option now than at any point in any of our lives. Renters have moved out another 35 to 45 minutes because they only go in the office once or twice a week, if ever, and they can't buy right? Their company might call them back into the office. So the property values haven't been pushed up in those tertiary markets, but the rents have. 
So I found a property where the numbers made sense with the rents and uh, purchased it. And then I see the wealth building journey gifted one deal on talk financial freedom membership to Wayne Wall. Awesome. Wayne, we will see you in the next members live. They generally come out on Saturdays or Sundays. It's kind of everyone's schedule dependent. It's a Zoom. You jump in. So you can watch on YouTube. There's a members only playlist of all the members only meetings that we've had. I tend to do about two a month. And the reason I do it in members is because, and I'll explain this for anybody who's kind of new. The way YouTube works is the beginning of the video, you want to say something that keeps people around, right? It's called a hook. So in the beginning, I answered questions of this video and let everybody know we're going to be answering questions for the remainder of the time. So the more people that stay around and watch and hit the like button, the more people YouTube shows this to. What we do in the members only meetings is we open an email from one of our agents about one of our deals and we look at it. We go through stream of consciousness as an investor. What would I look at? How am I going to break down this deal to decide if I would pursue it or not? We look at the market. We look at the aspects of the property. We look at the price. We look at the math. Imagine if you opened a YouTube channel and it was just people talking on Zoom, looking at emails, right? It would kill my channel. So the members that show up know that that's what it's there for. And there's usually like five to 15 of us on there all kind of hanging out having that chat. So Wayne Wong, see you there. Antoine, howdy. Currently using three property managers for my 22 properties across two states, Florida and I think that's Alabama. I went to school in America. They don't teach us things. My question is, when you transition to portfolio over to Hemlane, can I manage myself since I live in Hawaii? I don't recommend self-managing at a distance, even with Hemlane. I just don't. I think Mike is making the right call having a property manager. The reason I'm self-managing and able to, um, my goal for 2024, as people have heard it, is to spend more time out of the U.S. than in it, right? So how am I going to manage my properties? It's because I'm doing the opposite. What a lot of people do is they invest at a distance and they have to learn a market at a distance so they have a property manager there. I got my systems in place, my handyman, my contractors, everyone that I work with here local, other investors who I've done favors for, I've helped with tenant turnovers, I've helped with evictions, I've helped find contractors and handymen that I know I can reach out. I could probably reach out. Won't put you on the spot, but I could probably call Josh and Mary and say, hey, you guys are six doors down from my rental. Can you go knock on the door and see if they're all right? Like I'd probably call the cops for that instead, but I think Josh would go do it because We've helped each other, right? So I could be out of the country. I could call Mike and go, hey, I need you to go down and, and uh, serve this eviction notice in Spanaway, Washington. Fully vest up because it's Spanaway. Deal. And you'd go. Um, and I would go too. So do you have that kind of relationship and system in place in the two places where you have your properties? Probably not. Right. So since it's reverse engineered, I built all of the systems here and the network. And then I take myself out of the equation. And I, and I don't actually plan on adding a lot of units, right? I'm not trying to grow my portfolio more. I'm one of those weird investors that figured out what enough is, right? And uh, so, Mike, any other answer to Antoine, who has three property managers in two states but lives in Hawaii? Would you transition to self-managing? So here, let me rephrase the question. You're a first responder in Washington. You're growing your portfolio. You have 15 doors. Now you're stabilizing and you're growing and you're probably going to retire in the next few years from law enforcement. You're going to move to Florida and you're going to have a real estate license. When you are no longer working, you have control of your schedule. Are you going to continue to have property managers in Indiana? Yes. But it is only because the tenants that I have are from a tenant class that is much more likely to have problems than other tenant classes. If I was was in was building a rental portfolio here in Washington and I was building it in the area that I live in and they were higher, I don't, I don't know how to say this without sounding classist or whatever, but higher income tenants versus lower income tenants, you're gonna have different problems from each. In order to find the right tenants and properly vet them and then keep tabs on them. This is, I'll give you a line my property manager says all the time. Tenants are like children. You have to train them how to behave properly. Take that for what you will, but it's the truth. A lot of these people are renting in their 50s and 60s because they don't have the discipline. 
They don't have the structure in their life. They don't have the consistency of holding down a job. They don't have the processes in place to make normal life choices that everybody on this live stream would make, which is I need to figure out how to buy a house for myself and some rental properties and have good credit, et cetera. And so when you are working with those types of people that have those challenges, you want somebody who's local boots on the ground, who works with them all the time, who's going to babysit them effectively and call them and call them and call them about getting their rent in and the late payment in and yada, yada, yada. If you're working with a different tenant demographic and a different group of the, the young working professionals, you know, who are nurses and, you know, people that are in their late 20s, early 30s, who probably will become homeowners one day. Yeah. Could you potentially manage at a distance in a market that you've never lived in? Could you transition to Hemlane? Probably. I think you probably could. But I won't be doing it for Indiana because I think that's just very risky to do. And I've known people who tried to manage on their own from a distance and it didn't work out for them there. Well said. Santi asking, what do you think? More tenants for more cash flow or less debt, less tenants for a little less cash flow, but more passive headache free? There are people like Mike and Zuber and Matt who are going to grow massive portfolios. And the goal is to have hundreds of units, 100 plus units. I, I don't go, um, I don't want generational wealth, right? I don't want to leave my kids a bunch. They're going to inherit millions. That's not my goal. They're going to, it says an, it's an accidental byproduct of the thing I want to do. I want to make sure I'm not a financial burden to my kids when I'm too old to work. <laughs> That's what my portfolio does. So most people think I want to invest for the best yield. I want the best use of capital work. And I put my money to the most work. I looked for the right amount of cash flow with the least amount of units. So when you say the least debt, I didn't want the least debt. I wanted when growing the portfolio about a 70% loan to value um, balance, right? So I wanted more appreciation on more than what I invested, at least three times more than what I invested. When I retired in 2022, I wanted to be at 50% or less loan to value for more stability in retirement because I don't have the W-2 income. I have never used a home equity line of credit. I've never done a cash out refinance. I've never sold to 1031. So I haven't added debt other than saving down payments and buying the next property. It was a 10 year plan. I could have had much a much larger portfolio, I could have tripled my unit count in those same 10 years with thinner margins, right? I get well over $1,000 a, a unit in cash flow now. And if I had recycled capital and done HELOCs and cash out refinances and sold for 1031, I'd probably be getting three or $400 per unit, but have two or three times the number of units with more tenants, more management, more headaches. And that wasn't my goal. I wanted the right amount of cash flow from the least amount of units. And I think Mike, and Mike and Matt think I'm crazy. <laughs> Oliver, someone asked us this the other day. I'll see if Mike has a different answer. Deanna, Mike, do you ever have your tenants request rental declaration? Yeah. What do you mean by rental declaration? I had to Google it too. So it's this thing that has, so obviously the answer is no. There's something called a rental declaration that your landlord can provide to you if you're a tenant. And it can be used for things like, um, verifying residency or uh, something else. But no, I've never had a tenant ask for that. They have a lease, right? I email them a copy of their lease so they have proof of their renting that. Mm. Don't, yep, not a thing that we've ever had to deal with. Matt, I don't think he'd even, he might, have, he might, because he's so much freaking smarter than I am. He probably knew what it was and didn't have to Google it like I did, but he said, no, it's not been asked for it. Sanji says, I think Biden will put 40 or 45 year mortgages. I actually kind of agree because it's already a thing. If you went into forbearance in 2020 and you came out in 2021 because it was a 12 month forbearance, not only did you not have to pay the missing rents, the missing mortgage payments, it was moved to the end of your mortgage, but the lenders were required to offer you a 40 year term. So it's already kind of a thing for the people coming out of forbearance. And that's just the first step in it becoming more and more normal. And people are always confused. I would do a thousand year mortgage because I don't want my properties paid off. I don't care if they're paid off. I care about the cash flow and the yield. And none of that has anything to do with the property being paid off. 
a paid off property has a much lower yield than a property with a mortgage. T. Adams, it does seem when, when we are never to buy is when we should buy. Right, so it's never the market. It's the two things. Two things tell you when to buy. All night at Hydra. I don't, Biden has anything to do with the amortization of mortgages. No, but the last, so in 2025, the blame will be on the presidency. In 2024, the credit is going to go to the presidency. The incumbent always gets blamed for the good stuff. Jared, sorry, Stoners, howdy, Antoine, Ozark in Florida, Ozark, Alaska, Jacksonville, Florida, Alabama, Enterprise, Alabama. Nice. You shotgunned the country, and then Mike's battery died because that's how long it can last. Ninja Vanish, Peter Schiff. There was, there was a thing that came up where Peter Schiff is an emoji. He can't sue me for calling him an emoji, right? Uh, Duplex Dave, in my newer markets that I'm not as familiar with, I've used Thumbtack, as Deanna suggested, with good success so far. Me too. I actually just used it, uh, I want to say two weeks ago? No, a week ago. Use Thumbtack to have uh, cabinets installed. Very entertaining experience. Uh, definitely going to hire the person again, just halfly for the entertainment value of having him come and do that. Uh, Oculus to Sierra, how do you find customers to rent out land to RV travelers? I'm considering an RV pad on property with a rental. My friend that has RV pads uses uh, Furnished Finder for that. And then there's some questions about Jacksonville, not something I know of. Rob Dion, would you like to comment on Peter Schiff? <laughs> <sighs> or Skeeter Piff. There you oh, go. I liked that one. Somebody this put code that word, there. right? Exactly. Skeeter Piff. I know that he has paper thin skin and can't take criticism. I was going to say critique, criticism. Put a word in there. Uh, I have a cold right now and it sucks. Well, somebody hopes I feel better. I'll give that to you. Hope you feel better. I was sick over Christmas. Although sick over Christmas would have meant nobody came over. <laughs> been a good thing. Family. <laughs> Wealth building journey. Hoping for a speedy recovery. Hit me too. You. Here we go. The inside of the car is worth a thousand thoughts. Totally agree. Buzz tune. What is your guy's favorite part of a deal? Hunting, optimization, or stabilization? Favorite part of a deal, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I like I like finding the deal and structuring the deal. That's the unique aspect and unique challenge, you know. Uh, finding a good tenant is going to be the same every time. You're going to have similar requirements and the property manager is taking care of it. What they're going to rent for is going to be somewhat similar. Stabilizing. Yeah, I suppose stabilizing, you know, when it comes to like doing the repairs and stuff, that kind of goes into hunting for the right deal if you're doing value add deals. But for me, the, the biggest win is I just bought this $20,000 duplex with $3,000 down and 0% interest. Uh, I'm going to make $400 monthly payments for three years. It'll be paid off. And day one, I bought it. It was worth 55, 60 K. And then I'm going to put 10, 15 K into it. It'll be worth 150 K. So that's how I 7.5 X to my money. You know, like that sounds a lot cooler to me and is more fun in my opinion. Um, I'm the lazy investor. And while real estate ownership can be close to passive, it takes me two hours a month to manage my rental units. Real estate investing is not passive. You're talking 15 minutes to 30 minutes a day, looking at deals, several emails, making offers, negotiating, buying, closing, all of that. None of that for me was the goal. So the part that I enjoy the most, my favorite part, I would have to say it goes under your stabilization part portion, it's the binder strategy. I, the thing I enjoy the most is sitting down with a tenant who's probably afraid the new landlord is going to kick him out because that's your best goal. Your best outcome is you get rid of the tenant, you rehab the place, you get area average rent, you get the best, best return on your money. And I don't kick them out. And I actually let them pick their own rent and include them in the conversation. And to just watch that, I know it's the first time in their entire life that they've ever been included in that conversation 
that experience to me, it's the most fun. And T. Adams did interviews for a multimillionaire company. The car mattered the most. It is weird. It's a game changer. Yeah, we we uh, I took this from a company called McLean. They would interview drivers. They would do the interview, and before you before you were um, road tested, they would go and they would say, "Okay, stand here for a minute. We're going to go in and get the keys. We're going to take that truck and that trailer." And then the interviewer would go back in the building. Next to the driver where they were waiting would be a trash. Uh, receptacle and a cardboard compactor and then some detritus would be on the ground if the trash was still on the ground when the interviewer came back they didn't even do the road test they just said thanks for your interest and they wouldn't hire you how you do anything is how you do everything julie i bought a mobile on 11 acres the tenants are paying the mortgage and i'm going to build my house on it i'll just have to pay for the bill that's awesome yeah my brother bought a mobile on five acres and then added an ADU. And that's what he, so he house acts in his own version. He's never there. He's always gone. Like right now, I think he's in Texas. Um, we would keep track of cars by telling them where to park and a video and then send people out to look at it when they checked in. It was for the, an attorney job. Nice. Uh, the car mattered. Oculus, I'm going to Vegas early for Denny's meetings. What days are you thinking? Well, we're going to get there. Tuesday. So we're thinking Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights, midnight, or at least at least two of those nights, midnight, Absolutely. but not Friday, because I don't want us showing up to Zuber's event from two hours of sleep. Right. And I think he's probably going to have something Friday night anyways. Yeah, he would mention that some something. You can't underestimate the monumental success that the Midnight Denny's meetings have had over the course of my life. OK, I've been to Denny's at Christmas Eve and Christmas Day at one o'clock in the morning, more years than I can remember. OK, Denny's. Denny's is not just a cheap breakfast restaurant. OK, Denny's is not just the place that you go to eat when you're hungover. Denny's is not just a food establishment. OK, there's a special energy in America's diner. There's a special power that you can gain if you sit in there with the eggs and the bacon and the syrup and the waffles long enough you 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 attract this energy that is the lifeblood of america that is the that's the capitalistic entrepreneurial mindset okay and i want all of you to have an opportunity to just get a tiny portion of that energy to take four back to wherever you go home to okay because i promise you i promise you denny's is not just denny's it will be the Denny's and you'll be sitting there with Dion. You'll know what I'm talking about when you're there. No Mondays, always Saturday. Howdy. How you doing, Wayne? On the table, my renters effed up my table too. Yeah. That's why we get deposits. And if you do short term, that's why you have the service to go through. Wood floor alchemist. Howdy. Good to see you here. Saw you the other day on Matt's video. Ninja Vanish. Mike would make a good Aragon in a live-action Lord of the Rings. <laughs> My friends, you bow to no one. Also, for those of you who I always wondered, I thought that Dion got his, but not today, from Lord of the Rings because Aragorn rides around and goes, but it is not this day. That's like one of his famous lines. Where he's like, there, there may come a time when the strength of men fail them, but it is not this day. Ah, it's a great movie. The... Funny thing is, is a lot of people thought it was from Game of Thrones. What do we tell the god of death? But not today. It's not. Let me know in the comments if you want to know why, but not today. But I've already made the video, so I think most people know why I say that. Do well, why the eyebrow? Because But not today always comes with the eyebrow. Eyebrow and the sound, which is weird. If you play sound from a computer that is not the computer the mic is hooked up to, it doesn't pick up music, no matter how loud you play it. It hmm. awesomely filters it out. So... Figured that one out yet. Nice. Uh, Duplex Day, we tried to get a February Vegas ticket, but just ended up with endless scammers. Looks like it will be a great event. That sucks. Ninja Vanish, my friend had an Airbnb that was damaged. Tweakers did weird stuff like switching door handles around and stole appliances. Wouldn't surprise me. Have you met people? Cashflow, John Ramirez. Howdy. What's up, real estate freaks? Haven't seen you in a minute. Yeah, for Alchemist, if not house hacking, you have to get an investment loan with 15% down. And are you looking to turnkey properties or cheap properties and invest in cash to get it rentable? 
There's three different questions in there at least, and I don't think I have the answer to any of them that you like. The first one is you don't have to do 15% down. A lot of lenders will want 15, 20, or 25% down, but you could do zero. You can do 5%, you can do 10% on investment loans. Lending things change often every few weeks. You also have seller financing. You can um, find all kinds of ways to buy an, an investment property that doesn't take an owner-occupied loan to do. Um, would you want to do lower down though? I don't want to be that levered on a property. I kind of like the idea of having equity. I've done almost all turnkey properties, but never used a turnkey service. Turnkey service to me means upcharge. Mike, you have used a turnkey service on your first Gary property uh, with good results. Um, I, li I like right off the MLS that needs less than a couple thousand dollars worth of work. Uh, I know Mike, not to say that we disagree, but you like cheaper properties because you can buy more of them quicker. And investing in Gary, you had a network in place. I wish my properties cost twice as much as they did. Honestly, wish they cost way more when I bought them. Don't like cheap. I like buying a property that has a huge impact on my finances. And when I buy a duplex that costs me $400,000 and I add $2,000 a month to my cash flow in profit, I make one deal that impacts the next year by $24,000, not three or four properties. Um, and then the roof that I'm gonna replace on my duplex, it's covered by the 15% of gross rents that's set aside in less than a year. Nice. So, and not impacting cash flow, literally the part of the rent that's being set aside for repairs and maintenance. Uh, so there's no one right way, um, Wood Floor Alchemist. Mike's strategy is working for him. Like he, he's been investing since 2018. I started 2013. And uh, let me have first duplex. So I saved for two years before then. So I started two years before 2013. Your portfolio is almost the same size as mine. And I think by the time you've been, been investing a decade, your portfolio will be much bigger than mine. And you'll have ultimately more cash flow, more properties. Um, it, your strategy works for what your goals are. Rob says, go to Buzios in Brazil. I'll have to check it out. Uh, wealth building journey. Wait, what? I heard taxes and gains. Taxes on assets that can be resold are only on the gain of the sale over the initial cost of acquisition basis. Yes, you're right. If you're a United States citizen selling a property in the United States, if you're a foreigner investing in the United States, Google FERPTA tax. It's 15% of the gross. Nothing to, there's no, there's, they don't even know the basis. They don't know the debt. They don't know the expenses. You sell it for a million and you're paying $150,000 in tax. That's why when Eugen was asking, I don't think flipping or owning for a few years and selling is the best strategy versus my strategy of buy and hold until death to be part, I think makes more sense if you're not a U.S. citizen. Duplex Dave, any management software recommendations for cleaner coordination apps for VRBO Airbnb? Mike? Nothing, but I see that Marco Shiro posted, where did it go? He said that he, and he has managed Airbnb for a while. Financial Firefighter has his own YouTube channel. So Financial Firefighter in the chat, coming in clutch, says, I like using Turno for cleaner coordination. Uh, maybe you should make a video specifically about that, Financial Firefighter, because I can't speak to it. I'm doing all of my own cleaning because it's literally right there, and I'm still in the process of testing it out. One of the reasons not to do it locally. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to pay people to go do stuff so I can sit at home and play World of Warcraft or actually try not to kill myself on my um, inflatable paddleboard. <laughs> That's a good story for you. Dude, I don't have the balance for those things either. I like, I just would, I would just straddle the thing and just row it. Give me a kayak. Well, I, and <sighs> overshare, is it overshare time? Because I can blame it on the water that makes my eyes water. I did. I think it's overshare time. The fans are loving it. So in, in Desert Storm, I got the Enemy Marksmanship Award. So technically, only have one knee, and that makes paddleboarding <laughs> entertaining for anybody watching. <laughs> it's like the silver surfer you, pose. For those of you who need that translated, because Dion's too humble, that means that he was in Desert Storm while fighting and defending our country, lost a knee because the enemy was able to inflict damage on him in either the form of a of a freaking bomb or a uh, or a bullet. So thank you for your service, Dion. And yes, I would love to see you fall into the water because I look, I stand on the thing and I just look all gangly. I make one swipe and then fall the other way. 
So that's why I don't generally overshare on here because my kids will sometimes watch and they know that I went over for Desert Storm and all we did was planted flowers to make the world a prettier place. <laughs> uh, Jared, 70 people on here, only 19 likes. If you find value, it takes a hot second to hit the like button, but it's kind of a pain because you have to close the chat for a second, hit the like, and then open the chat. So I even, I like, I watch Zuber's channel and I'll be watching halfway through the video. I'm like, oh, I forgot to do that. After I make the comment of every time you hit the like button and the angel gets its wings, then I'll go, I didn't hit the like button. But thank you for that. T. Adams, day one to now. I live on same property and I will continue until I can find next deal. Nothing wrong with house hack. So hopefully you're still getting interest on that video. We got we stirred up a nice bee's nest in the bigger pockets forums on when I put that video there. So some great comments of... There is some Ramsey support. There is some logical. Ramsey is great with this advice, right? The things he nails for the people who needs it. And then, and then there was some, I just can't stand the guy post too. Wealth building journey. Buy a house for 250,000, appreciates to 400, once sold taxes on hunting. Yeah, since the gains of sale exceeds the, co the cost basis. But that's what we were talking about is Eugen is from um, another continent. So he won't have it based on a cost basis. Uh, cash flow with John Ramirez. I'm a new investor started in 2020. It's been hell of a ride. It's a great year to start. Look at the appreciation you've had if you purchased starting then. Mm -hmm. And the rent increase, that hasn't sucked. Unless you're a renter. Look, the, there are people who say uh, it's cheaper to rent than to own. Right? There, there might be places where you can pay rent that would be less than the mortgage. Now, look at that mortgage a decade from now and compared to what the rents are going to be a decade from now. When property taxes and insurance go up, your mortgage will go up a little. But what do you think your rent's going to do in a decade? Mm -hmm. I shared this earlier in this video. That doesn't look like a downward trend. You can point to seasonality and you can say, hey, in the winter, some places and large multifamily might be getting a lot of builds completed and so rents go down. But large multifamily doesn't impact the rents of duplexes or single family houses or houses with an ADU. Be wrapping this up here in a little bit because we have, I've got the course video that starts in 13 minutes. So let me look through. Is there any questions that you see that you want to make sure we get to, Mike? Uh, let's Let's see here. There's a bunch that were coming in. Uh, See, Laura made a, a suggestion in Brazil. That's awesome. Thank you, Laura. I will have to check that out. Actually, Laura, I'm probably going to ask you where to go in Panama. Um, not sure when I'm going there. I know Thailand is next. And then the end of this, of 2024, I have to pick a place for a few months. And I'm not sure yet yeah, where. Woodford yeah. Alchemist, why did they ask you to raise the rent? Thank you for coming to the channel. I appreciate, I love it when somebody new comes to the channel. Um, Mike, go ahead. You had a question you were going to do? No, I mean, J uh, Wood Floor Alchemist, go take Dion's free binder strategy course. It's free. It's free. Maybe, free 99. Okay? Maybe Chester or one of the other um, moderators in the chat can post it. It's a free course. It's actually kind of what I'm most known for in real estate. It's what got me invited on the Bigger Pockets podcast, episode 448. Um, my tenants ask me to raise the rent. I can find cash flowing deals on the MLS. It's a lot easier when you have a strategy that gets your tenants to ask you to raise the rent. And in a lot of the cases, it's if I raise the rent a hundred bucks as the landlord, I'm a jerk. But my tenants ask for the rent to go up four or five hundred dollars and then thank me when I agree to it. Uh I love it when someone new comes, and so I'm not trying to make light of that. I'm really glad that you're here. I hang, thank you for hanging out with us. Um, and if there was more than 11 minutes left, I would just take the time right now and teach you what the binder strategy is. But it takes at least 10 minutes to get the full idea of what it is, which is why I made a free course. And it's not uh, you go in and I share the strategy, but I go, but there's a real secret. And all you got to do is get behind this paywall. It is a free course at deontalk.com on the binder strategy. In that course, not only do I teach you how to get your tenants to ask you to raise the rent, I just had section eight ask me to raise the rent. That was only $300, but they asked me to raise the rent starting January 1st on my tenant by $300, which I'll take it. It works with property management. It works at a distance. It works locally. It works self-management. 
Now, the whole course is there. And in that course, I also include my spreadsheet on how I track my income and expenses with my portfolio, which is kindergarten simple. It was something me and my CPA put together, satisfies what they need, and it covers what I need to run my business. And I include my seller financing letter pitch. Wayne Wong, good for Yeah, I sent you that seller yeah. financing contract, by the way, a week later, two weeks later. My bad. I emailed it to you. you right it finally, because yeah, yeah, I want to get it to the guy because yeah. I know you're going to include it in your course, which you're just about done creating, right? I, I mean, I could put, I, I, if people want, I'll put the link to my website. I, I built a website. If you join the email list on the website that I built, I will email you a free seller financing legal contract that cost me 500 bucks that I use to do multiple seller financing deals. It's free. You've got to sign up for my email list. I built the website. So if you guys want to go to it and you want to test it out and tell me if there's any bugs on the website, I'd actually appreciate that. Also, when it comes to getting joining my email list, I'm not going to email you every day. I'm going to email you maybe once a week. And it's going to be an email that I write about what I think is going on in the markets, answering some questions I got throughout the week. So I'm trying to provide value that way. But if you want a free seller financing contract, I'll put the link for my website down here. You, you join my email list and I will send you that contract for free. And that's step one of me launching the course that Dion's been telling me to launch now for a year, probably. It's, it's one of those things, Mike, where all of my content is here on my channel, right? All of your content is on your channel, shared freely. But can does somebody want to sit through five or six hundred or getting to thousands of videos to narrow down to the few things that they are going to apply? Or do they want a chronological format of the, you know, the actual information that you use that's applicable? Because some of what we talk about is mindset. Here's how you, if you think a certain way, you're probably going to reach financial freedom a lot easier. And then it's how do you screen your tenants? How do you diversify your portfolio, right? So there's like very different things there. That's what the course does. When you make your course, I'm going to be happy that when somebody says, hey, I'd like to invest out of state, I don't just go, hey, why don't you go watch Millennial Mike? He'll answer questions on Instagram. He's got a lot of videos on how to do that. I'll be able to say, if that's exactly what you're wanting to do, A to Z, start to finish, how do you prep for it? How do you do it? How do you get your systems in place? Here's the course you take, right? That's for very selfish reasons. I'm looking for a place to send people to get your information. There are a whole bunch of questions here I would like to answer. I'm going to be making some questions separately. For, so like Christine, uh, I'm doing a video soon on the cash flow of, on the year of owning a rental versus the 10th year of owning a rental. And JMC, I am doing a video on red state versus blue state. And I'm going to try to stay as impartial as I can because that can get your YouTube channel canceled. If you say anything that makes the left not look good, because the left owns YouTube, they just shadow ban your channel. Look at Todd Baldwin. He went from 60 to 70,000 views of video to 300 views of video, just because he did a video on socialism. That, that's actually one of the reasons why I want to have a course because of questions like the one that JMC asked here, which was, Howdy, Dion, does it matter what state you invest in, red versus blue? We can't give our honest opinion, because if we do, you'll get banned or you'll get shadow banned, or you'll get silenced, or something bad will happen. Uh, do you ever want to talk real estate with a couple of guys shooting at the rifle range? Because I'd love to do a video with me and Dion just at the range, shooting guns, and talking about real estate. We can't put that on YouTube. You, you, that will just ruin your entire channel. Uh, and so things like that will go in the course, where we can, we can be unrestricted as to the opinions and what I want to talk about, what he wants to talk about. So that'd be another reason to join. But I think you should end on this question right here from JMC, which is, what do you do when you're an overthinker, overanalyzer, and you feel paralyzed in getting on the property ladder? So I took a screenshot of that because I was thinking of starting like the next live or, or the next video on that. But since you asked, we will answer and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, when you were an overthinker like Zuber, who spent six months in his spreadsheets, right, before learning his market and getting out and traveling and looking at them, he, he says this himself. So I'm not calling him out on it. He says... One of the mistakes I made early on was I spent six months living in my spreadsheets. I'm an underthinker. So I had to think, what do I want to know for sure before I take action? So an overthinker, instead of thinking, what do you want to know? Because there's no limit. I think you would reverse that and say, what timeline do I set to give myself to know that enough to take action? 
So to take this from the Marine Corps, no plan ever gets to 100% and then goes. You get to 80%, you start taking actions because things are going to shift as soon as things start going downrange. So a 100% plan would have too much to change. But 60 to 90 days to learn your market. If at 90 days, you absolutely know your strategy won't work in your market, now you've learned the skill you can take to another market. Now you've learned the skill to take to another asset class. So for me, that was studying single family, didn't work, moved to small multifamily. For Zuber, it was Sacramento doesn't work, he moved to Fresno, right? So not moved to Fresno, but he moved his investing to Fresno. What's the time limit you set to limit the amount of time you will give yourself to learn something. Because as soon as you learn as much as you can, re read one book on a subject, you already know more than 95% of the people about that subject. So study it. When you have reached your timeline on how much time you'll give yourself to learn, if you know you're an overthinker, and I say this to my son all the time, if you're happy and you know it, overthink. Then you think, I have given myself the time to learn what I need to. I'm now going to take action. Action could be, and this is, confidence comes from competence, right? So if you're competent in something, you will have the confidence to go to the next thing. You learn how to save by increasing your income and decreasing your expenses. Once you've learned how to do that, doesn't it kind of make sense to look at your credit score? Once you've learned how to save and you've figured out how to get your credit score to start to improve itself, doesn't it make sense to then go talk to a lender? Once you've talked to a lender and you understand what your limitations are or your options are, kind of makes sense to know what market you can look at now, what asset types or price range, right? So real estate is very chronological when it comes to steps, but it is not chronological when it comes to the mental aspect. So for that, I think you can, as an overthinker, start setting times for you to limit how long you will study a given subject. Would have had, I think, a better answer if I had time to prepare an actual video for that, but uh, knee-jerk reaction answer. With that, Mike, how can people find you if they want to reach out with more questions? I just put this, this is the first time I'm sharing my website that I, that I taught myself how to make and I created it myself by watching YouTube videos. I shared my website down in the comment section. So if you do want that free seller finance contract, no catches, uh, just send me an email, join the email list or look me up on Instagram or YouTube, Millennial Mike. We talk about long distance or out of state investing. Perfect. And Wombat Striker, you're, you're absolutely right. The reverse binder strategy can work on your property taxes and a reverse binder strategy presented by a tenant could get the landlord to ask the tenant to lower the rent because area average rents set rents, not what they were paying last year and not what your expenses are. With that, thank you all for hanging out with me. I look forward to seeing everybody in the course video, which starts in two minutes. Um... I kill the right thing here before me and Mike say all of the things they could have sued until my next video. Thanks for coming to my Dion talk. And we're off of YouTube.